Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of World's Panorama. Here we are getting you your weekly dose of major international news with a perspective. I'm Sana Khan. Before we get you detailed reports, here's a look at the top stories this week. India ASEAN inch closer to free trade pact and services investment, special emphasis laid on maritime security. Park Gwen Hai elected first a woman president of South Korea vows deeper engagement with the North. U.S. fiscal cliff talks languish as Republicans fail to agree on tax plan with Plan B off the table. What next? And we'll also get you a look at the BBC Sports Awards of 2012. Tour de France's Wiggins backs the Sports Personality of the Year honour. And straight to the story in focus this week, unveiling the vision of a resurgent and integrated Asia, India and the 10-nation ASEAN on Thursday declared the conclusion of negotiations on an FTA in services and investment and upgraded their ties to a strategic partnership that includes closer cooperation in political, economic and security areas. Countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia and several others want this expansion of the FTA, which has been concluded after several months of long-drawn negotiations. Meanwhile, amid appeals by some Southeast Asian countries to New Delhi to play a role in resolving the South China Sea issue, a cautious India on Thursday rejected any intervention, saying that the issue of sovereignty must be resolved by countries which are party to the dispute only. Now, we will be delving deeper into the two-day summit and get you a perspective on various issues that were discussed with our guest this week. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Pramit Pal Chaudhary of the Hindustan Times on the show. Welcome, Pramit, to the show. Now, we'll get his perspective in just a bit, but before that, a look at this report. Armed with a substantive free trade agreement, India and the 10-nation ASEAN took ties to the next level, creating a strategic partnership at a time when Chinese assertiveness has unsettled many in the region. Participating nations vowing on Thursday to step up cooperation on maritime security, a move that comes amid tension with China in the potentially oil and gas-rich South China Sea. India and ASEAN nations should intensify their engagement for maritime security and safety, for freedom of navigation, and for peaceful settlement of maritime disputes in accordance with international law. Trade between India and the 10-member ASEAN was up to $80 billion last year, compared with $47 billion in 2008. The aim of this pact is to boost the trade tie-up to up to $100 billion US dollars by 2015. There is also much potential in our work on connectivity, which we have recently embarked on together. This will not only bring our people closer together, but also expand our trade and business networks. An ASEAN summit ended in acrimony last month over China's assertiveness in the South China Sea, with its leaders failing to agree on a concluding joint statement. The South China Sea has become Asia's biggest potential military flashpoint as Beijing's sovereignty claim over a huge looping sea has set it against Vietnam and the Philippines as the three countries race to tap possibly huge oil reserves. Malaysia and Brunei, also members of ASEAN as well as Taiwan, also claim parts of the sea. All right, let's uh, start discussing this issue deeper. Pramit, the significance that ASEAN has accorded to India was evident with the fact that so many big leaders, prime ministers of these several yeah. ASEAN nations were here in India. Mm -hmm. If I had to take an overall perspective first, how would you see this summit? Well, I think, as you said, it marks the importance for both countries, both, both for India and for the ASEAN countries, how much they moved forward in their relationship. Hmm. Uh, the FTA agreement will essentially, it's hoped, will allow bilateral trade to rise to about $70 billion uh, by 2020. Uh, as you know, we had a first FTA, which is mainly on goods, first free trade agreement. That was right. done. Uh, that benefited mainly ASEAN. Hmm. Uh, now the second one, which focuses on services, which is what India's competitive edge is now done. So we will be the primary beneficiaries, we right. hope, of the second part. So, uh, you know, also a point, despite these historical hmm. and cultural ring links hmm. of India with these uh, nations, do you think that uh, India has perhaps lost a lot of time in uh, engaging itself hmm 
in this particular region. India has ignored this region for mm -hmm. a long time, and this is probably a step in the right direction from India. And you know, right. nations can go ways from here. Well, the the fundamental problem that India had with engaging with the Southeast Asian countries was that we were not open in our own economy. Until we carried out liberalization of our economy in 1991, we were unable to do anything with ASEAN because they, they basically said that your tariff rates, your protectionism, your unwillingness to trade is so massive, there's nothing we can do with you because we are essentially a trade and investment body more than anything else. Right. So we begin the Lukis policy with Narasimha Rao when he announces the economic mm. reforms. They were part, even then it took us a long time to catch up because our, our tariff rates were so high, we were yeah. so unwilling mm. to come down. And now we've accomplished that. Uh, so on the trade and investment side, it's taken us a long time. I agree. I mean, China was, has been miles ahead of us and trades 10 times more right. with ASEAN. But we've now caught up, hmm. uh, at least on the institutional side. So uh, would you agree with the fact that India's look east policy has graduated to a trade east policy and now moving uh, towards, you know, more into security, you know, maritime yeah. security cooperation? That is important. Uh, you know, one right. thing that has come out of this summit. Yes, because you saw ASEAN as the core of the East Asia Summit. And by expanding the original ASEAN plus three summit, which was Japan, Korea, China, to incorporate India, the United States, and other countries into the East Asia Summit, you effectively brought India to the regional architecture in which ASEAN is the core. Okay. The next step has now been, we now have at the bilateral level, we have a large number of military and security understandings with these mm. countries. And now most recently we've begun to at least take positions on things like the South China Sea um, and the Straits of Malacca. So a country like Indonesia is one of our biggest naval exercise partners. I think it's number two or three in the world. Right. Um, and even countries like Thailand, we now mm. have submarine patrols, joint submarine patrols in the Andaman Islands. Okay. So having said that, you know, many smaller mm. nations in the region are counting on India at this point in time. Do you mm. think India has the capability to emerge as a serious player uh, in terms of... Uh, you know, be it economy or security in this particular region? Well, the game is basically, are we able to up our game? Because right now, as I said, China economically dwarfs us. I mean, China is 10 times bigger than us in every single one of these countries. Hmm. And in some of them, like Myanmar, it's about 20 or 30 times larger in terms right. of trade and investment. On hmm. the other hand, very few of these countries want to have a security relationship with China. They're very wary of China. The Vietnamese, the Filipinos right now are, in fact, uh, almost at uh, loggerheads with China over terror territorial concerns. Some of the others, like Myanmar, are worried that China may one day take over large portions of their country by de facto uh, economic growth. So those, that side of that relationship, therefore, allows India to grow while China is going to be stalled for some time. Okay. So that's going to be a question of how much we are prepared to take uh, in the initiative on that security side. And we, I think, are moving forward, but I would, I would argue we're moving very slowly. Okay, a lot of catching up to do yeah. there. India, but nevertheless, it, the process has begun. Yes. And uh, by 2020, as the trade, uh, we are expecting to, uh, you know, more than triple or quadruple, right. like $200 uh, billion dollars by 2022. We'll have to end this discussion from it. Mm. Thanks so much. Thank Interesting pointers there from you. We hope to have you on the show soon, yeah. next time around as well. Now, with that, we take a very short break. But after that, we'll get you the latest on Egypt's referendum on the new constitution. Don't go anywhere. You're watching World Panorama. Park Geun Hye's election as South Korea's first female president could mean a new drive to start talks with bitter rival North Korea. Though it's unclear how much further she will go than the hardline incumbent, a member of her own conservative party. After five years of high tension under unpopular president Lee Myung Bak, Park has vowed to pursue engagement with Pyongyang despite its continuing nuclear program and its widely condemned long-range rocket launch last week. <laughs> Park Geun Hye is all set to make an emotional return to South Korea's presidential mansion in February as South Korea's first female leader. More than three decades after she left it following the assassination of her father. 
60-year-old Park scored a decisive victory in the vote on Wednesday, ensuring that South Korea's conservatives who pushed through a free trade agreement with the U.S. hold on to the powerful presidency for a second consecutive time. It was a tough and challenging election, which was a hard time. I sincerely appreciate people for doing their best to the end. Park geun said her victory would help her country's economy recover. This election is your victory. This is a victory brought by the people's hope for overcoming crisis and economic recovery. Turnout was higher than it was in either of the last two presidential elections and some analysts thought it might lift Moon, who's more popular with younger voters. Despite moving to the centre, however, Park was carried by her conservative base of mainly older voters. Our society's conservatives and left-wingers brought their maximum forces to this presidential election. Especially the opposition parties had unified Moon Jae-in and Ahn Chul Su to win. Park will return to the country's presidential mansion more than three decades after she left it following the assassination of her father. Now, Park's victory ensures that South Korea's conservatives who pushed through a free trade agreement with the US hold on to the powerful presidency for a second consecutive term after the end of incumbent Lee Myung Bok's mandatory single term in office. And a Republican plan to let tax breaks expire on U.S. millionaires collapsed late on Thursday when it failed to earn enough party support, leaving talks on averting the fiscal cliff up in the air. Details follow. The latest attempt to avert the so-called fiscal cliff, which many economists say threatens to send the United States back into recession, has failed. A vote on a Republican bill to limit tax rises to those earning more than $1 million a year was abandoned last night in the House of Representatives due to a lack of support. We don't just have a fiscal cliff. We have a fiscal abyss in front of us. And that is the debt crisis that is on our horizon. Failure to address this debt crisis means not just 47% of Americans, but every American gets hurt. Every American gets a lower standard of living. Every American, especially the next generation, receives a lower standard of living if we don't fix this mess. In a brief text statement, Boner said it was now up to President Barack Obama to work with fellow Democrats in the Senate to hammer out a deficit reduction deal that could prevent automatic spending cuts and tax hikes from kicking in next month. We're wasting valuable time. Uh, the Speaker should be engaged with the President of the United States in negotiations rather than having walked away from those negotiations with the President. The dramatic twist threw into disarray attempts to head off $600 billion worth of indiscriminate tax hikes and spending cuts that could push the U.S. economy into recession next year. Now that House Speaker John Boerner's Plan B for addressing the fiscal cliff has crashed and burned, the top U.S. Republican appears to have two remaining options. Wash his hands off the entire matter or negotiate a compromise with Democrats that could abandon scores of his fellow Republicans. And just two days before a constitutional referendum it considered boycotting, Egypt's secular opposition finally launched its no campaign on Thursday with newspaper and TV ads detailing the argument against the charter drafted by Islamist supporters of President Mohamed Mursi. The Mursi camp has a simple message. A yes to the constitution is a yes to Islam. A report. The deadly violence and harsh divisions of recent weeks, combined with the inability of most Egyptians to even comprehend the densely written 63-page constitution, have turned the vote into a stark choice on whether the largest Arab nation takes a step towards theocratic rule. Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists have been plastering posters across the country, urging Egyptians to vote yes to protecting Islamic Sharia laws. The opposition's campaign is focused on the slogan a constitution to divide Egypt. Activists also took to the streets with loudspeakers atop pickup trucks touring Cairo and other cities. 
The opposition campaign began a day after the National Salvation Front, an umbrella group of opposition parties, announced it was calling on supporters to vote no rather than boycott the referendum. Although uh, the judiciary uh, refused um, to uh, make some sort of supervision on the referendum on the new constitution, um, uh, I think uh, people in Egypt now are the real hero of the political scene. One of the observers of the referendum pointed out that violations had abounded when he visited a huge number of polling stations for round one. However, the government denied any instances of violations taking place. The official results for the referendum will be announced after round two, an indication that reports of violation will not stop the process. A total of 17 provinces will be included in the last round with the majority leaning toward a yes vote. Time for another short breather. After that, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange threatens to release controversial secret documents in the coming year. Stay tuned for more. Thanks for staying with us. Time now to take a look at some of the other international news in a quick wrap. Here's Globe Watch. At least 13 people were arrested on 19 December outside the Russian state Duma, the country's lower house of parliament. The protesters were holding one-man pickets against a controversial law to be voted on later by the Duma deputies banning US nationals from adopting Russian children. Russian authorities have been angered by the U.S. Congress passing the so-called Magnitsky Act, which will bar entry to the alleged Russian human rights violators and freeze any assets they hold in the U.S. South African President Jacob Zuma was re-elected for a second term as president of the country's ruling party, the African National Congress, on Tuesday during the 53rd National Elective Conference. Zuma defeated his deputy, Molanth, in the race for the position of ANC president. Cyril Ramaphosa was elected as ANC's deputy president. WikiLeaks will release one million documents next year affecting every country in the world, founder Julian Assange said in a speech from the balcony of the Ecuadorian embassy in London. In a Christmas message marking six months since he sought asylum in the embassy to avoid extradition to Sweden over claims of rape and sexual assault, Assange on Thursday also said the door was open to negotiations. And if you've missed the week's biggest sporting events, here's your chance to catch up. We get you sports action. Bradley Wiggins capped his remarkable sporting year by winning the 2012 BBC Sports Personality of the Year award this time. Some of the top names in sports, including Olympic champions and Premier League soccer players, attended the BBC. Sports Personality of the Year Award in London. The other athletes shortlisted were four times Paralympic swimming champion Ellie Simons, five times Olympic cycling champion Chris Hoy, four times Olympic sailing gold medalist Bane Ensley, and the first woman to win a boxing gold medal, Nicola Adams. Barca captain Carlos Puyol told the media that even though Barcelona may be on fire, but won't be writing off Real Madrid just yet despite stretching their lead over their great rivals to 13 points on Sunday. Real Madrid in third after an erratic start to their title defence drew 2x2 two two at home to Espanyol and Barca later beat second-placed Atletico Madrid 4x1, with Lionel Messi scoring twice. The results leave Madrid 13 points behind Marca, but we all warned his team could not relax. Undefeated Barcelona have won 15 and drawn one so far in La Liga. Swiss ski cross competitors Armin Niederer and Fanny Smith continued their winning days in the FIS World Cup on Wednesday. Both have been the season's first event held in Canada on December 9th and were again at the top of the podium after the racing in Val Thoreau. Niderard won the men's race, beating Canadian Brady Lehman and American Joe Swenson to the finish line 
while Smith overtook Norway's Marty Hoy Jefferson on one of the jumps to take the honours. And time now for all the very latest news from the world of movies and lifestyle. Here's our entertainment wrap. From writer, producer, director Baz Luhrmann comes the new big screen adaptation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby. The filmmaker created his own distinctive visual interpretation of the classic story, bringing the period to life in a film starring Leonardo DiCaprio in the title role. The Great Gatsby follows a would-be writer Nick Carraway as he leaves the Midwest and comes to New York City in the spring of 1922. The film, initially scheduled for release in the United States on Christmas Day, will now be released on 10th May 2013 in 3D and 2D. The Hobbit brought home a big box office treasure over the weekend, setting a December movie record with $84.77 million in US and Canadian ticket sales as legions of fans turned out for the long-awaited big screen return to Middle Earth. The Hobbit, an unexpected journey, also rung up sales of $138.2 million in international markets. Global receipts for the prequel to the Smash Lord of the Rings trilogy stood at $22.97 million through Sunday, distributor Warner's Brothers told the media. It's Christmas time and people online are busy checking out Grease sweethearts John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. The original single of the album, I Think You Might Like It, reached more than 7.7 .7 million views on YouTube and Vivo. The duo filmed the video with a few friends, family and signature line dancing moves over the course of a few hours. Proceeds from this Christmas will go towards the actors as charities. Romeo Beckham, the second oldest child of David and Victoria Beckham, has followed his parents into the world of fashion by modelling for Burberry's Spring-Summer 2013 collection. Although the advert features two other people, the 10-year-old is clearly the focus as the male and female models stand motionless like mannequins while Beckham moves around pointing an umbrella and posing to the camera. That's all we have for you in this edition of World Panorama. I'll be back next week, same time, with more world news. Till then, you can join us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates from us. This week, we wrap up in festive spirit as the who's who of Hollywood are here to wish you all happy holidays. Goodbye and thanks for watching. Hello, everyone. I'm Scarlett Johansson and I'm wishing you a happy holiday. Everybody out there to have a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I'm wishing everyone out there a happy holiday. I just wish everyone a very... Merry Christmas. I wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas from Matt Damon. Hope they just have a great New Year next year.